friends, we are thrilled today to learn about the pen and the sword in the Warsaw Ghetto, a presentation by Dr. David I. Bernstein, who is the Dean of the Pardes Institute for Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, wonderful, wonderful learning institution. Previously, he was the director of Midrashet Lindenbaum. He has a BA and MA in history and a PhD in religious education from NYU. His passion for Jewish history has taken him as historian in residence with student and adult groups to Poland, Prague, Budapest, Vienna, Berlin, and other important European sites of Jewish life. We are thrilled to now have Dr. David Bernstein as a regular here at, at Valley Beit Midrash, where we can learn um, uh, together around the world uh, about Jewish ideas and ideals. And uh, once again, today's topic, the pen and the sword and the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanna wish everybody happy Hanukkah. Uh, and it was uh, because of Hanukkah uh, that I chose tonight to speak about two kinds of Jewish heroism, uh, the pen and the sword. And uh, we'll start out um, by trying to understand uh, the Warsaw Jewish community on the eve of the Nazi invasion, the German invasion of September 1st, 1939. Warsaw was the largest Jewish community in the world, except for New York City. There were about 380,000 Jews living in Warsaw. They constituted almost a third of the population of the city. And just that we could, just for us to get a sense of what that means, the Jewish population of New York at its height was 28%. So Warsaw was more Jewish than New York. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Warsaw falls to the Germans. And on Rosh Hashanah, 1940, meaning about a year later, the Germans announce that they will establish a Jewish residential district in Warsaw. There were ghettos established in other cities in Poland before Warsaw. <clears throat> And there were some that would come after. Um, it is not by chance that the Germans announced on Rosh Hashanah this terrible edict that the Jews who were being terrorized uh, would now have to move into a separate location cut off from the city. On Yom Kippur, 1940, 10 days later, they announced this all has to take place within a month. These were edicts that were designed to coincide with Jewish holidays. Jewish holidays and Shabbat are meant to recharge our spiritual batteries, to make us feel closer to our communities, uh, to uplift us. The Nazi war against the Jews was not only a physical war, but a psychological war. And the timing of these decrees was meant to demoralize the Jews, to break them. And indeed, in November 1940, the Jews were forced into the ghetto. Pam, can you show the, uh, the second slide? Here is a picture of the Jews moving into the ghetto. It's really so tragic and so sad just to look at this picture. People had to move out of their homes. By the way, the Polish Catholics who lived in the ghetto area also were forced out of their homes. But the Jews of the city who didn't live in the neighborhood of the ghetto were forced to relocate and take what they could with them. We can go back to the regular screen, Pam. The first great history of the Holocaust, academic history of the Holocaust was written by Raoul Hilberg of Dartmouth College. 
And Raoul Hilberg identified four stages in the destruction of Polish Jewry. And all of them were connected to the ghetto. The first stage was concentration. That is, the Nazis worked to concentrate the Jews from the smaller shtetlach, from the small market towns into larger towns, from, surround, from uh, areas that surrounded large cities into the large cities. And this is what they did in Warsaw. And tens of thousands of Jews from neighboring towns on the outskirts of Warsaw were forced to come into the ghetto, swelling the ghetto's numbers to not 380,000, but 450,000. But concentration had another aspect to it, and that was the purposeful, terrible overcrowding in the ghetto itself. In an apartment that normally used to house one family, the Nazis put a family to a room sometimes six or seven people living in the same room. And imagine what it means if let's say it's a three bedroom apartment with one kitchen and one bathroom. And by the way, in those days, apartments in Warsaw often had bathrooms down the hall. But let's assume this was a more luxurious apartment and they had one bathroom. Instead of a family sharing this apartment, you had three or four families, one in each bedroom, one in the living room. The families sharing one bathroom all together. It could be 20 people, 25 people sharing the same bathroom, sharing the same kitchen. Imagine what that meant. Imagine the crowding the physical crowding, what does it mean for privacy? Even within the one room of your own family, forget about the strangers whom you don't know and you may not like, and you may have a totally different way of life than they do. You might be secular, they might be religious or vice versa. And you have to get along somehow or not. But even in that space of your own family, typically a father, a mother, let's say two or three children, maybe four children, maybe an elderly grandparent who lives with them, in a room that's wall to wall beds. What does it mean for privacy? What does it mean for personal hygiene? <clears throat> There were epidemics of disease in the ghetto and no wonder. I remember reading in Lucy Derivitz's War Against the Jews, which came out in the 1970s. <clears throat> I remember reading Lucy Derivitz write that the greatest killer, disease killer in the ghetto was not typhus and not cholera but heart disease. When I read it, I did double take. I, heart disease? Then I realized the stress of everyday life, the stress of having no space to yourself, of living in such close quarters, the stress of not knowing where the next piece of bread was going to come from, where your next meal would come from, and worrying, how will I feed my child? Or how will I feed my elderly parent? The stress of everyday life made heart disease the greatest disease killer in the ghetto. That's concentration. Raul Hilberg cites a second phase in the destruction of Polish Jewry which he called confiscation. First concentration and confiscation. Confiscation of Jewish bank accounts, of Jewish real estate, 
Jewish homes that were outside the ghetto, Jewish stock holdings, automobiles, telephones owned by Jews were confiscated. This had a double purpose. On the one hand, it enriched the Nazi war machine. On the other hand, it weakened the Jews. Because if you don't have assets, if you don't have that business, that shop, that factory, it's been taken away from you. If your bank account's been taken away from you, you're much more vulnerable. When someone is rich, when someone has some assets, not even rich, they have options. They can pay someone something to help them. Even if they can't pay at the moment, someone knows that they have the assets, would be more likely to help them. But once destitute, the Jews become much more vulnerable. So there's concentration, confiscation, and the third stage Raoul Hilberg identifies is weakening, the physical weakening of the Jews due to mass starvation. The Nazis provided very little food for the ghetto. One of the ghetto diarists, Alexander Donat, D-O-N-A-T, writes that 80% of the food in the Warsaw ghetto was brought in by smuggling. And the smuggling, was sometimes done by Jewish criminals who had underground connections with Polish criminals and were large scale smugglers with very sophisticated ways of smuggling, including bribing the guards. And sometimes the smuggling was done by Pasha to Eden, simple Jews, often children. Pam, if you can go to the next slide, I believe it's the third slide. <clears throat> I wanna read a poem together with you, written by <clears throat> a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto, Henrika Lazowert, called The Little Smuggler. Over the wall, through holes and past the guard, through the wires, ruins and fences, plucky, hungry and determined, I sneak through, dart like a cat. At noon, at night, at dawn, in snowstorm, cold or heat, a hundred times I risk my life and put my head on the line. Under my arm, a gunny sack, tatters on my back, on nimble young feet with endless fear in my heart. But one must endure it all, one must bear it all, so that tomorrow morning the fine folk can eat their fill. Here's resentment against some of those big time smugglers who actually made a fortune in the ghetto, literally, there were a small number of Jews eating caviar in the Warsaw Ghetto. Over the wall, through holes and bricks at night, at dawn, at noon, plucky, hungry, artful, I move silently like a shadow. And if the hand of destiny should seize me in the game, that's a common trick of life. You, mother, do not wait up for me. I will return no more to you. My voice will not be heard from afar. The dust of the street will bury the lost fate of a child. And only one request will stiffen on my lips. Who, mother mine, who will bring your bread tomorrow? That's the third stage weakening. And the fourth stage, deportation. Concentration, confiscation, weakening, deportation. <coughs> Excuse me. Deportation to Treblinka to a death camp that's about 80 kilometers, about 50 miles <clears throat> from Warsaw. The great deportations, the great wave of deportations of Warsaw Jews begins in the summer of 1942. The truth is, even though thousands of Jews have died in the ghetto, the vast majority of Jews have somehow managed to live. They've managed to live through terrible conditions now for a year and a half. And they've managed to do so because of self-help, because of mutual aid, because of morale raising uh, schools and youth movements and theater 
and concerts and lectures in the ghetto, religious life. They managed to survive the vast majority of them until the summer of 1942. That's when the Nazis begin to transport an average of 5,000 Jews a day to Treblinka, where those deportees meet their death within hours. As Raoul Hilberg writes, a man would arrive at Treblinka in the morning. He would be gassed, his body would be burnt, and by evening his clothing would be on a train headed back to Germany. It was all very fast. Remarkable German efficiency. Up until the great deportations, which took the vast majority of the Jews, 300,000, in a period of about two months from Erev Tishabav until Yom Kippur, 1942, two months of summer, July, August into September, that took almost three quarters of the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto to their death. Up until the great deportations, the reigning philosophy among the leadership of the Jews in the ghetto was Iberleben, outliving them. We will outlive them. That after all was the strategy that worked for Jews in the diaspora for 2000 years. We will find a way to outlive them. We will bribe this one. We will go around that one. We will somehow find a way to live. And the young youth movement leaders who advocated armed resistance were in the minority. The great deportations changed that. Because after the great deportations, there was a feeling of great shame in the ghetto, a feeling of mourning. When I say the number, 300,000, of course, it's a, 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 a statistic. It doesn't mean anything to us. Joseph Stalin, one of the great mass murderers of history, who may have killed more people than Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin once infamously said, the death of a million people, the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. So I want to give you another statistic that I think might bring it home a little bit more. Before the great deportations, we estimate there were 50,000 Jewish children under the age of nine in the Warsaw Ghetto alive. 50,000 Jewish children in the Warsaw Ghetto under the age of nine. After the great deportations, 253 of them were left alive. 99.5% had been murdered in those two months. The future of Warsaw Jewry had been wiped out. As more and more people favor resistance, two resistance leaders emerge. Pam, if we can go to the slideshow again. Ah, Adam Chernyakov, sorry. Adam Chernyakov was the head of the Yudnara, the Jewish council in the ghetto, when he actually believed in the idea of Ibeleben and not armed resistance. He believed the Germans when they told him the Jews would not be deported. And when he finally got the deportation orders in July 1942, he took cyanide and committed suicide rather than be a part of the deportation process. Let's go on to the next slide. Mordechai Nilevich, as you can see, he was 24 years old when he led the Zob, Z-O-B in Polish, Jewish fighting organization in English, in the armed revolt against the Germans that took place in 1943. Anilevich was a youth movement leader from a socialist Zionist organization called Hashomer Atzair, 
the young guard, he actually had escaped from Warsaw. He came back because he felt he shouldn't leave his students. He shouldn't leave his youth movement youngsters alone in the ghetto. And if we go to the next slide, less well known, but also a leader in the armed resistance was Pavel Frankel. You see, even in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Jews could not totally unify under one banner to resist the Germans. Most of the Jewish groups united under the banner of Mordechai Nilevich, but the revision of Zionists held out and they formed a separate group led by Pavel Frankel. Their group was called the ZZF, the Jewish Military Organization. And um, they coordinated together with Mordechai Nilevich's group, but they didn't fight together. They fought separately. All told, there were about 750 fighters. They were very poorly armed, lightly armed, but they had a tremendous amount of support in the ghetto in the period after the great deportations. They held out for weeks. They actually fought the Nazis longer than the country of France. From Erev Pesach, Pesach Eve, 1943, into May of 1943. And finally, let's go to the next slide. And finally, the Nazis come upon a different strategy. Initially, the Nazis simply entered the ghetto in April 1943 and were met with gunfire and Molotov cocktails, homemade gasoline bombs, and the Nazis actually retreated. When they came back more heavily armed and with artillery, they also had a new strategy. They came with flamethrowers and they began to burn the ghetto. And in this picture, you could see in the background, the smoke from the flames of the ghetto has a way of fleshing out not only the fighters, but those Jews who are hiding in bunkers, which is what the resistance fighters had told the Jews who were not armed. They said, find hiding places, dig cellars, hide in attics, and the Nazis drove them out with their flamethrowers. And here you can see a group of Jewish prisoners being led by the Nazis and they will be taken to Treblinka if not shot beforehand. Let's go to the next slide. And here you could see a group mostly women and children. This is an iconic photograph. These photographs, by the way, were of course taken by the Germans. And to me, this photograph of the little boy, one of the 253 children under the age of nine left in the ghetto with his hands up, with the German soldier in back of him with the rifle pointed at him, to me, this is the iconic photograph of Jewish helplessness in the Shoah. The question is, why did they fight? They weren't going to defeat the German army. The German army had taken over almost all of Europe. So why did they fight? First of all, according to those who few who survived. They wanted to choose their own death. They wanted to take away the German decision about how to kill them. They preferred to take their own death into their own hands, not their own life, but their own death into their own hands by fighting. Secondly, they felt it important 
to redeem Jewish honor. They felt that the great deportations had been going like sheep to the slaughter and somehow armed self-defense, armed resistance would redeem Jewish honor. So they thought. They also wanted to make a statement that would inspire others to rebel. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the first major uprising in a European city against the Germans. All of those European countries that have been occupied by the Germans, there was no major uprising in any city until the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And in fact, their uprising did inspire a Polish uprising a little more than a year later and uprisings by Jews in Treblinka and in Sobibor, two death camps and elsewhere. Last but not least, and here it may not be politically correct to say, but nonetheless, we need to tell the truth. There was the issue of revenge. When Abba Kovner, the leader of the Vilna partisans, wrote a broadsheet asking people to join the partisans, he said, avenge our brothers, avenge our sisters, avenge our murdered children. And in Warsaw, one of the fighters in the ghetto uprising was a woman named Tzivya Lubetkin. Tzivya Lubetkin, wrote that on the first day of the uprising, when the German troops had to retreat and take with them their dead and wounded, she wrote, we were overjoyed to see German blood on the streets of Warsaw after seeing so much Jewish blood on the streets of Warsaw. Sylvia Lebetkin was a very heroic woman. She wasn't only a fighter, she was a courier who went from ghetto to ghetto. She later made Aliyah, came to Israel, was a member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. And by the way, her granddaughter was the first female pilot in the Israeli Air Force. So you don't mess with the Lebetkins. So the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is a story of one kind of heroism. But I wanna to move to a second kind of heroism. And that is not the sword, but the pen. If we can go to the next slide, Pam. Here I want to talk about Emmanuel Winkelblum, one of my heroes. He's the subject of a biography by Professor Sam Cassow of Trinity College called, quote, who will write our history? When the book came out in 2008, it was reviewed in the New Republic. And the professor of history who wrote the review wrote, quote, this may be, well be the most important book about history that anyone will ever read, end quote. Professor Sam Cassell wrote this biography of Ringelblum, and some of you may know that a movie has been made. Uh, I believe that uh, Stephen Roberta something, I'm forgetting her name, and Steven Spielberg's sister, I think, were involved in making a wonderful movie uh, called Who Will Write Our History, which I highly recommend, which talks about Emanuel Ringelblum and what he did. Emanuel Ringelblum was born in 1900 in a small shtetl called Buchach in Galicia. It's the same town that Shai Agnon, the Israeli Nobel laureate for literature was born in. He grew up in a religious Zionist home, but like many 
in the early 20th century in Poland, like many other young people, he moved away from religious observance. But he remained a passionate Jew and a passionate member of a group called Left Poelation, uh, a socialist Zionist organization. And Emmanuel Ringelblum studied history. He got his PhD writing about the history of the Jews of Warsaw. He moved to Warsaw. And uh, when in October 1938, the Nazi regime expelled thousands of Jews from, who had come into Germany from Poland in the decade between the wars and dumped them on the Polish border. And the Polish government refused to allow them to return, even though they had Polish passports. And they were stuck on the border in the fall of 1938. And it gets cold in the fall of, nine, of, of any year uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum is one of the leaders of the relief efforts to help those Jewish refugees. When the Germans invade Poland September 1st, 1939, Ringelblum begins to write a diary. Sensing that what was happening was of great historical importance. But when the ghetto was formed in November, 1940, Ringelblum did something that nobody else did. There were plenty of ghetto diarists in Warsaw and elsewhere. We have many of them and they're very valuable works. But Ringelblum went a step further than that. He brought together 60 men and women in a group that they called Oynik Shabbos, Oynik Shabbat. They used that name because they used to meet on Shabbat afternoons in the building of the Jewish Historical Institute, which was in the ghetto. And these 60 people were charged with documenting everything that was happening in the ghetto. Everything. Collecting candy wrappers, collecting theater tickets to performances in the ghetto collecting report cards from the underground schools in the ghetto, collecting diaries, organizing poetry writing contests for teenagers who would be asked to write about what their experience was living in the ghetto, organizing research studies into the role of women in the ghetto. By the way, that was decades before any university created a women's studies department or course. They also did research projects into smuggling and research projects into religious life in the ghetto. And who were the 60 people he brought together? He purposely chose the widest spectrum possible. Not only writers and historians, but poets, uh, rabbis, uh, tradespeople. And he didn't just choose people from his own left poetry own group. He chose communists and anti-communists, religious people and atheists, left-wing Zionists and right-wing Zionists, and anti-Zionists, Bundists. He brought them all together, knowing that objectivity, this is Ringelblum speaking, objectivity is impossible, he wrote. What we can hope is to get as many understandings of the same situation as possible, to get as, as wide a picture of the same event as possible. This was decades before postmodernism. Ringelblum was really a man ahead of his time. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> One of the things that they included were the sermons given by one of the most important rabbis in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Eish Kodesh, the Piasechna Rebbe, Rabbi Kalman Kalonimus Shapira. 
a Hasidic Rebbe and Rosh Yeshiva. He was the head of a yeshiva called Darkei Moshe that he founded in Warsaw, which had hundreds of students. It was one of the largest yeshivas in Warsaw. <clears throat> and Rabbi Shapira would give a sermon every Shabbat morning, every Saturday morning. And then Saturday night, he would go home and write down what he had said. And he collected all of those notes and gave them over to the Oenik Shabbos group. Later, when they would be retrieved, they were published under the title Eish Kodesh, Holy Fire. They've gone through a number of editions. Most recently, a couple of years ago, a critical edition came out that shows photos of the actual uh, manuscripts uh, and makes certain corrections based on that of, of previous editions. Um, the Ish Kodesh has been translated into English, uh, most famously by, uh, um, by Rabbi Nehemia Polin of Hebrew College in Boston. Uh, and um, it's actually a very, uh, the uh, Rabbi Shapira's works have become very popular, particularly among yeshiva students today uh, in Israel and in the United States. That was part of the Onik Shabbos archives. But not only that, remember we saw the picture before of Adam Chernyakov, the head of the Unirat, the Jewish council. The Onik Shabbos groups, obtained the notes of the meetings of the Yudnarat and make them a part of their collection as well. So they had not only the writings of leaders in the ghetto, but also the writings of teenagers writing poetry about their life and theater tickets and candy wrappers about everyday life in the ghetto. Let's go one, one more slide. This is Emanuel Ringelblum with his son Uri. During the uprising, Emanuel Ringelblum escapes with his wife and his son Uri. And on the outskirts of Warsaw, <clears throat> he finds sanctuary with a Polish farmer. Excuse me, the Polish farmer was hiding some 30 Jews including the Ringel Blues. Unfortunately, the daughter of the farmer broke up with her boyfriend and the boyfriend decides to inform on the family. The Polish rescuers were murdered. The Jews were taken to the Paviak prison, the notorious SS prison in Warsaw. And there, a member of the underground writes <clears throat> that he managed to slip into the prison. And he told Ringelblum, who was, of course, a very prominent figure in the ghetto, he told Ringelblum they could get him out. They could say he was a shoemaker and get him out of the prison and escape death. Ringelblum looked at the member of the underground and said, what about my wife and the women's part of the prison? What about my son, Uri? The underground member writes, I was silent, I had no words. Of course, we wouldn't be able to rescue his wife nor his young child. He continues to write, Ringo Bloom understood my silence. And he said, if so, I prefer to go the way of Kiddush Hashem, of sanctifying God's name. And Regal Bloom was murdered in the Paviak prison in Warsaw by the SS at the age of 43, together with his wife and child. The Einik Shabbos group <clears throat> had hidden all of the documents, hoping that one day they would be found and fearing a German victory. They wanted to tell the, the Jewish side 
of the story of the Warsaw Ghetto. And there were only three survivors of the Yonik Shabbos group. Hirsch Wasser, his wife, Bluma, and Rachel Auerbach. As luck or divine providence perhaps would have it, Hirsch Wasser was one of the few who knew where the documents were hidden. And I want to stop here to just give Myra Tritel a moment to share something personal because Myra had a direct connection to Hirsch Wasser and through her father, a connection to Emanuel Ringelblum. Myra. You're muted, Myra. Unmute yourself. Um, you know, I, I can cry every time I hear this story. Um, Hirsch Wasser came to our apartment on the Lower East Side. I have pictures where I'm holding Hirsch Wasser's hand and calling him Uncle Wasser. Uh, the, the story is, is part of my DNA. Uh, my father was a youth leader in the Linka Poliseum. He went in when he was about 15 years old. He was bright and the leaders saw that he was a bright young fellow and they pushed him up the ladder and he was the, uh, the head of the youth movement. Um, Ring Ringelblum was his mentor and teacher. And my father did everything in his power to try to make a Ringelblum Institute in New York City. In fact, I, I told Dr. Bernstein that once the phone rang on our Lower East Side apartment and it's Gideon Hausner, the famous judge from Israel from the Eichmann trial who wanted my father and a professor from Columbia to do everything possible to make a Ringelblum Institute. Um, there were people that wanted to make the Holocaust a museum in Washington, which I'm glad that they won out, but uh, they sort of threatened my father because the same people that would have given money for the Ringelblum Institute are the ones that gave for the um, Holocaust Museum. But it was my father's dream to make a Ringelblum Institute. And we have one now in Warsaw. Um, I would rather it have been in New York. Uh, Herr Schwasser was the one who found the milk cans. Uh, that were hidden, and of course, all of Warsaw was destroyed. So, it, 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 it's, it would be very prudent to see the film Who Will Write Our History? And it's Roberta Grossman and Steven Spielberg's uh, sister. Um, Nancy, I think her name is. Nancy, Nancy Spielberg and, and Roberta Grossman. And uh, actually, uh, you can even get a, a, a shortened version for schools, you know, for, for Jewish schools. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, there's a famous Zionist by the name of Sarah Bovel. I Would you know the name, Dr. Bernstein? Z I'm sorry, was there was a, a Zionist that took the name Zerah Bovel. Uh, uh, mm hmm and he was giving us uh, a lecture in, in Warsaw and Ringelblum came late. The door was already closed. It was a very famous lecture. And Ringelblum was so angry at himself that he stood out in the freezing cold. He couldn't forgive himself that he didn't get there on time. He was just a remarkable person. And the reason my father is alive is that when the Nazis marched in on the, uh, the first day, there were posters on the kiosks where my father was giving speeches. So he would have been rounded up on day one as a political prisoner, not even as a Jewish prisoner. Um, he was very lucky uh, with the help of the Jewish Labor Committee and Eleanor Roosevelt. 
he got a visa and came to the United States in 1941 and then was drafted into the American army. Uh, it, it's, it's very emotional to me because uh, when I hear that they went like lambs to the slaughter, I, I know of the heroism and, um, and I think every day that a Jew continued to live was an act of heroism. Uh, I, I'm gonna, you know, get emotional. I've been to Poland twice. My father lost every member of his family. And I couldn't even talk to him about it. It's, it's very painful being first generation. And not only that, I'm a little uh, children that did survive. I'm older because my father got to the United States in, in 41 and I was born at the end of 42. So I never had anyone to share this story with. And, um, you know, I would whisper the word survivor. It, it was a holy word to me and nobody knew what I was talking about. None of my friends. Um, I went back to Poland with a Yivo group with Sam, Dr. Caso being the scholar of in residence. And I went back uh, a second time just about four years ago. And I saw the mounds where they took children up to the age of four and just smashed them against brick walls. And they're buried in those mounds. So it kills me when there are Jews today that don't care, that don't remember, that are anti-Israel. Uh, and I will mention, I just read a phenomenal book, The Light of Days by Judy Battalion, which is the first definitive book about female Jewish resistance, which is beyond belief. Um, and of course, Sylvia Lubetkin and her husband, Ante Zuckerman. And um, I'm just very proud my parents never stopped. My parents were poor. They never stopped giving charity. Um, my father, who was left Poilitzion, did join the Workman's Circle, which was not a Zionist organization. They were the Bundists. But if you mention my father's name in the Workman's Circle, they say, oh, the Zionist. And they started raising money at um, the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz when Sibyl Lubetkin was teaching um, American teachers to teach the Holocaust in the school. I, mean, I have loads of anecdotes, but I think I spoke enough and I cannot thank you enough for doing this program. I, I just can't tell you what it meant to me. Thank you, Myra. We appreciate that uh, personal aspect that you were able to bring to this. Pam, if we can go back to the slideshow. So as Myra said, in 1946, in the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto, if we can go, keep, go one more slide. In the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto, right, that's it. Um, Hirsch Wasser organizes essentially an archeological expedition. Even though he knew where things were buried, it was impossible to locate even the streets because everything had been destroyed by the Germans. And so ultimately they were able to find 10 tin boxes. Here you see one of the tin boxes and you saw a slide beforehand that Pam showed was one of the milk cans uh, which was the uh, second group of documents that they found actually by accident. In 1950, Polish construction workers came upon these metal milk cans. Can we go back one slide, Pam? Uh, you may have seen it at the US Holocaust Museum in DC or at Yad Vashem here in Israel, these metal milk cans that were also used to hide the documents, the tens of thousands of documents collected by the Onik Shabbos group. We can go back to the the other slide. The third collection of documents has never been found. 
And Professor Sam Casso believes that it will never be found, not that they are lost. But the tens of thousands of documents that we do have uh, that were found by Hirschwasser in 1946 and by the Polish construction crew in 1950 provide us with a tremendous amount of historical information, primary sources about what life was like for the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, in that sense, there was some semblance of victory. Who will write our history? The answer is that because of Oynik Shabbos and others, survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, we have been able to write our history, tragic as it is, but nonetheless, we have been able to write our own history about what terrible things happened in the Warsaw Ghetto and elsewhere during the war. Let's go to the next slide. I want to share with you a document that was found in the Onik Shabbos archive, found in that first group of tin boxes that Hirsch Wasser discovered, Uncle Hirsch to Myra, written by Israel Lichtenstein. With zeal and zest, I threw myself into the work to help assemble archive materials. He was a member of Onik Shabbos. I was entrusted to be the custodian. I hid the material. Besides me, no one knew. I confided only in my friend Hirsch Wasser, my superior. Let's think for a moment if Hirsch Wasser had not survived, we might not have ever found this treasure trove of documents. It is well hidden. Please God that it be preserved. That will be the finest and best that we achieved in the present gruesome time. I know that we will not endure. To survive and remain alive after such horrible murders and massacres is impossible. Therefore, I write this testament of mine. Perhaps I am not worthy of being remembered, but just for my grit and working with the society on Shabbat, and for being the most endangered because I hid the entire material. It would be a small thing to give my own head. I risk the head of my dear wife, Gela Sextin, and my treasure, my little daughter, Margalit. I don't want any gratitude, any monument, any praise. I want only a remembrance so that my family, brother and sister abroad, may know what has become of my remains. I want my wife to be remembered, Gela Sextin, Artist, dozens of works, talented, didn't manage to exhibit, did not show in public. During the three years of war, worked among children as educator, teacher, made stage sets, costumes for the children's productions, received awards. Now together with me, we are preparing to receive death. I want my little daughter to be remembered. Margalit, 20 months old today has mastered Yiddish perfectly, speaks a pure Yiddish. At nine months, began to speak Yiddish clearly. In intelligence, she is on a par with three or four year old children. I don't wanna brag about her. Witnesses to this who tell me about it are the teaching staff of the school at Novolipki 68. I am not sorry about my life and that of my wife, but I am sorry for the gifted little girl. She deserves to be remembered also. May we be the redeemers for all the rest of the Jews and the whole world. I believe in the survival of our people. Jews will not be annihilated. We, the Jews of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Lithuania, Latvia, are the scapegoat for all Israel in all the other lands. Dated July 31st, 1942, the 11th day of the so-called resettlement action, in reality, an annihilation action. It is almost 80 years later, after Israel Lichtenstein wrote his last will and testament, and almost 80 years later, we remember him. We remember him, we remember Emmanuel Ringelblum and the Yonik Shabbos group. We remember Mordechai Levitch, we remember Pavel Frankel. We remember all of the fighters of the ghetto uprising. And we remember, remember them in Scottsdale in Arizona. We remember them in Jerusalem and Israel. We remember them wherever we are today. We're fulfilling their wish, the wish that Israel Lichtenstein wrote. He only wanted a remembrance and we remember him here today on Hanukkah in 2021. 
Thank you very much. Very powerful, Dr. Bernstein. Thank you so much for this. Um, friends, we're almost at time, but we have time for maybe one, uh, one question if someone would like to jump in. I, I just want to mention when, um, uh, Dr. Bernstein, when you said about that they died of heart, uh, Herr Schwarza, after he visited us, uh, very shortly after he returned to Israel, uh, he had a heart attack and died. And um, Antik Sukaman, uh, yeah, they, they died young. They died, they died young of heart attacks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for this uh, very powerful presentation today. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing to learn with you. And thank you all for joining us. Um, and we have many other programs coming up this week and next week. We hope you'll continue to join us. Have a wonderful day and Hanukkah Sameach. Hanukkah Sameach.